Well, next, we get to have the opportunity to listen to the United States Transportation Command commander, General Darren McDew. Now, General Darren McDew is a 1982 graduate of VMI. I knew there'd be a few of you guys hooting and hollering out there. He started out by tankers, in tankers. He was in tankers for a while. He uh, eventually moved up the staff, doing all kinds of great things, ended up doing some C-17 work, before which he was uh, assigned as the military aide to the president. He's worked in legislative affairs. He's done the joint staff. He was the deputy 18th Air Force commander. He was the 18th Air Force commander, and he was the Air Mobility Command commander. I can't think of anyone better qualified to be serving as the United States Transportation Command commander. Now, I will tell you one thing. You read all that and about his bio. You know all that. But I'm going to give you a little tidbit that you probably didn't know. Because I mentioned he was a cadet in 1982. And he came for an orientation flight on a KC-135. So as a cadet, he flew in the back of, an, of a 135. I know that for sure because I was the aircraft commander that day. And that's when I first met Darren McDew. He's a man with a tremendous talent. I consider him a great friend. And even though you don't see him sitting here, I'm going to say, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome General Darren McDew. He's hiding. Thanks. 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 Uh, thank you very much. I was a little concerned because you guys gave all the applause to General Light this last time. Uh, so I was a little concerned. So I had to bring out my beverage of choice. They typically put water back here, and, and that doesn't do a lot for me. I'm a southern boy, as you know, and this is, in fact, the nectar of the gods, Diet Coke. So I'll have that here a little bit. Uh, good afternoon. I, I do appreciate that welcome, and I did meet uh, General Art uh, Major, I think, Art Light, what he didn't tell you was his co-pilot that, that day was a guy by the name of Tom Caperton. How do I remember that? Uh, Tom Caperton ended up being my instructor at Castle when I went through initial call in the 135. I was meant to be here. Um, now, I don't know how many of you remember last year, there was a guy by the name of Dan Clark who spoke. Remember him? Um, yeah, great motivational speaker, an amazing man, great credentials. Well, I, was, I had some envy going last year. He's an NFL, former NFL player, I believe, tall, good-looking guy. But I said, well, what's the difference between him and me? <laughs> that wasn't the funny part. So <laughs> I said, well, the difference is he's got a hero video. Now, he's got a hero video that has all kinds of celebrities talking good things about him. It says he's got theme music. He's got all this cool stuff that happens that gives him kind of street cred, validates who he is. So I now have people. <laughs> so I said, I want, I want a hero video. So let's, let's play the video.
Ja. I hope you're able to notice the difference between Dan Clark's hero video and mine. Uh, he had celebrities. I got real heroes. And I get the opportunity to play that. Now, that's our first ver variation on it, and I'm gonna, we're going to work on that a little bit more, but I'm going to use that everywhere I go as my hero video, and I get a chance to brag about the heroes in this enterprise. And I'm extremely proud of you, and I'm honored to be here in front of you again, especially as a fired commander of Mobility Command. <laughs> so good afternoon. This is, in fact, a reunion. I called it that last year, and I, it's the same again getting a chance to reacquaint yourself with old friends and old timers. And I'm not just looking at Dewey. There's a lot of really old people here. <laughs> and I've been to a lot of conventions. And uh, I will tell you, this is up here for one reason. I I'm good at doing this. And bear with me for a minute while I walk through this. For those of you that are coming here for the very first time, you don't understand yet how powerful this event is. Not every event is opened up by the secretary and the chief, only to be followed up by the 17th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. Uh, General Welsh and Secretary James we, and Chief Cody, we should thank them very much for the time that they commit to our airmen. I was feeling pretty good in, until I listened to them. Uh, I had remarks prepared, and they stole everything I was prepared to say. And then I panicked. But I have people, and they had a couple hours to work, so I've got remarks again. So it's really, <laughs> it works out really well for me. I want to pause and recognize a couple of great leaders that are out here that are probably, no, they're, they're going to be at their last ATA in uniform, and I want to acknowledge both of them for their service. Uh, Chief Master Sergeant Gamble and Chief Master Sergeant Rodewald, th this will be their last one. And the reason I'm signaling them out, and there's other people that will be here for the last time, these two have personally mentored me and helped me become successful and helped me lead. And I want to thank them very much. And I will say this, I will take uh, my cousin Vicky's quote, which is, I've never met an airman I don't love. Uh, and that love will keep them close. And I just want to say both of you, thank you very, very much. General Light and ATA, again, I thought last year was exceptional, and it was. This is even better. I don't know how you keep pulling it off, but I'm glad you do. Thank you and your entire team at Air Mobility Command for doing this. Uh, General Everhart, I I'm proud of you, man. I really am. And so what you have done with the command already and what you're going to do is going to be extraordinary. And when you have a rough day and on your toughest hour, remember, you're better than the guy you replaced. It's an intimidating lineup that typically sits down here in the front row, and I, and I need to acknowledge them, and uh, I'm inspired by the folks that came before us, and you should too. If you've not taken the time to bug the crap out of the folks sitting down here in front, please do it. They want you to. They have lots to share, and they're actually nice people. So please take that opportunity. And I, I've seen people like General Cassidy. I believe General Fogelman is here somewhere. McNabb, Light, Johns. That's, as the chief said, that's, that's royalty in this command. And I thank them for continually being here for us and with us. It, it becomes the magnitude of this forum. And, and I know a few minutes ago we acknowledged another gentleman on the front row, and we didn't acknowledge his bride. But I'm going to do it again because I think it's important. And I'm going to say it this way. He's an American hero a living example of the Air Force's core values, a reminder of the significance of what we do for our nation and what we should aspire to be. And one more time, ladies and gentlemen, Medal of Honor recipient, Colonel Joe M. Jackson. We should never take his service or the other recipients or your service
for granted. So doing it more than once, I think, in this case is okay. I also want to thank uh, all of you for attending and just being who you are. And uh, let me get on to a, another component. So I've been talking about this new phrase, our fourth component. You saw it in my hero video, and that's our commercial partners. More than 50 of them have joined us for this ATA, and unlike the 12th man in football, they're actually on the field, in the game, making plays, making such significant plays that I don't think, no, I know for a fact, we could not win without them. And I want to thank our commercial partners, and we'll talk a little bit more about them and let you know how truly special I believe they are, and I want to consider them my fourth component. Got to work on the words, it'll scare some of them, but it's important to me. Uh, I talked about mobility airmen, but let me tell you, it's been just a couple months since I've uh, taken command of Transportation Command and just a little bit longer than that since I was fired at AMC. The, the chief wants me to stop saying that. And I said, chief, I did not leave on my own. <laughs> it was not my choice to leave. Uh, but this is an amazing organization that has a long history, and I'm just grateful to still be a part of it. Let me tell you what I have seen as the Transportation Command commander. I'm the only combatant commander that gets thanked by the others. And I get thanked because of what you do. They are extremely grateful for what you do. They don't understand it, but they trust it. I was reading in my classified reports the other day, there are some countries that can't project themselves out beyond 30 miles from their capital. We can project power any place we want, and that's because of you. Any place, any time, you do it without fanfare, without fail, and without accolades. Now, speaking of the world, sometimes we get so busy with the operations we conduct and support that we have a tendency to sometimes having that blur. And at night on the news, you can become numb to what you see every day. Show the video, please. President Obama got an update on the Ebola crisis today. Afterward, he said the chances of a quake so big it shook Mount Everest. Now the United States is sending a disaster response team and one million dollars. Iraq has formally announced the start of a military offensive to liberate Ambar province from ISIL militants. The ultimate aim. To the U.S. military is flying manned surveillance flights over Nigeria at the request of the Nigerian government in search of the nearly 300 missing girls kidnapped by Boko Haram. Baltic states are mulling a joint air defense system amid regional tensions with Russia. The defense We're now breaking news. This is significant. Getting reports minutes ago that Russia has launched airstrikes in Syria demanding the U.S. Jim Shudo, he's in Manila right now in the Philippines. He has an exclusive report on that confrontation between the Chinese military and a U.S. spy plane. Jim, tell our viewers... Our starting point today, the escalating tensions between the two Koreas Emergency meetings have been held in Seoul and Pyongyang. Russia's presidential spokesman has said the recent escalation in eastern Ukraine is an apparent violation of the Minsk agreement. For more and more Finally, we've just learned, Jenna, from NORAD that Russian warplanes were sighted off the coast of California and Alaska on July 4th. Good evening. We learned today it will be up to the next president to end the American war in Afghanistan, a conflict that is... But we want to begin this morning in India. As we mentioned, this is day one of the president's historic visit. No sitting president has ever made a second trip to that country before. Something I believe came up in the news Wow. That's just been a year. I mean, can you imagine that? Russia, China, Middle East, West Africa, POTUS movements, natural disasters, all since we met last year. In that short excerpt, I hope you saw the number of major events you supported, that we supported, and the vast span of our operations. But let me remind you, behind the headlines, there's only one constant. That's you. In every last one of those, the face of that is you. And after the headlines have lost their luster, you're still there taking care of business. The fact that you're still there after the luster is gone happens far too often because you react quickly to the crisis 
you make the miraculous happen, and rarely does anyone circle back to say thank you. Well, this afternoon, simply, thank you. It is recognized every time. Today, I want to take a few minutes, though, and take you back to an event recent where you rode in the front seat of what I think is history. I don't say that just from a military point of view, and it's easy to say it from a military standpoint, but this is actually from a human point of view. Walk with me for a few minutes through the despair, panic, action, hope, and ultimately success that was our response to the Ebola crisis. Nearly 40 years after first striking fear with a painful and grotesque set of symptoms, the Ebola virus is back. An outbreak of the deadly Ebola virus has killed at least 60 people in the West African nation of Guinea. And health officials say the virus may spread to neighboring countries if it's not contained. Please stay away from the dead body. Please stay away from the dead body. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention sent a health alert today to U.S. doctors about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the largest ever. Since March, more than 1,200 people have been infected with the Ebola virus. More than half, 672, have died. Dr. John LaPook tells us two Americans are now infected. With airports on high alert for flyers with Ebola symptoms, what are the chances this deadly virus comes to the U.S.? Should we worry here? Here's the hard truth. In West Africa, Ebola is now an epidemic uh, of the likes that we have not seen before. It's spiraling out of control. It is getting worse. It's spreading faster and exponentially. If the outbreak is not stopped now, we could be looking at hundreds of thousands of people infected with profound political and economic and security implications for all of us. On the 16th of September then, when the president kind of gave the order to go ahead and, and go, we were able to uh, get C-17s airborne within 24 hours with the initial uh, survey team for the contingency response group. And they got there about the same time that the initial team from U.S. Army Africa uh, got there on the ground to establish the Joint Task Force. We placed two additional mobile medical labs into operation last week, significantly increasing the capacity for rapidly diagnosing Ebola. We are also establishing a facility capable of training healthcare support workers, enabling healthcare workers to safely provide direct medical care to patients. The State Department came to us and asked us to start looking at the ability to transport patients that were contaminated and within a month of the requirement documentation, we had a solution. United States Transportation Command is implementing the use of Transport Isolation Systems, or TIS, to safely transport infected patients inside of air mobility aircraft. Soldiers from the U.S. have arrived in the Liberian capital, Monrovia, to help fight the spread of the deadly Ebola virus. They've already started to build a 25-bed Ebola isolation center for healthcare workers infected with the disease, which will be staffed by American medics. The arrival of U.S. troops is a ray of hope for most Liberians, who think the American forces will help wipe out Ebola. I just wanted to remind you, I don't think you had time to pause. The world needed help. In this case, it was West Africa. But when the world calls, they call one number, the United States of America. When the president sets these objectives, there's one other phone that rings, and that's his, and then yours. And you deliver. Remember, there was hysteria and fear and anxiety. It had set in around the world, and, and in this country especially. And you, it's hard to remember how bad it was for just a second. The media quickly moved on to the next story. But let's go back and tell the rest of this story. And some good news in the fight against Ebola. New numbers from Liberia show a dramatic decline in the rate of new infections. The president announced Wednesday that all but 100 will return home by April 30th. Not to declare mission accomplished, but to mark a transition. Thanks to the hard work of our nearly 3,000 troops who deployed to West Africa. Logistics have been set up, Ebola treatment units have been built, over 1,500 African health workers have been trained.
There are people in this world that worry about what's their legacy going to be. Well, you impacted millions that you'll never see or possibly meet, such as the human beings attached to the hands that were on that blue wall if you missed it during the video. There was a statement on that blue wall that I had a hard time catching the first time I saw the video, so let me read it to you. It said simply, today I am healed, tomorrow I return to heal another. That's pretty powerful. That's not military, that's human being to human being interaction, that's an amazing legacy. Your actions replaced despair, replaced panic, fear, and hysteria with hope and success, and for many, many families, a future. You made it look easy, but it wasn't. Many of you came home and weren't warmly received in your communities. We had gotten so hysteric that we were firing people who had just been to Africa, let alone been exposed. We had in-system selects that redirected many of you into the fight. We had leaves canceled. We had people subjected to 21-day monitoring. It was not easy, but it was worth it. There is a personal sacrifice story I want to share with you, though. It's this one. So there was an aircraft commander from Charleston who, during his 21-day monitoring period, decided to do the right thing when he got a low-grade fever. He called his flight doc. His flight doc then did the right thing and called the Center for Disease Control. What happened next was that scene outside his door that looked like a scene out of the movie Outbreak. Anybody, anybody besides me remember that movie Outbreak? See all those suits? That was outside his door in Charleston. He then found himself in a bubble being transported to the Medical University of South Carolina. He endured all that and his family endured all that, but what makes me smile a bit is the picture to the left over there, you see with the guy with the green tape on his back? That's a selfie. Um, so the enduring truth, there's never a bad time for a good selfie. <laughs> Through all that, he took time to take a selfie. Next slide. I now want to congratulate and thank our fourth component. There are lots of commercial partners that help us a lot of times. And, you know, over the last 15 years, 90% of our passenger capability has been in the commercial industry, 40% of our cargo. But this one was, I think, more special. Crowley and Omni International uh, came to help us when not many people would or could. Um, Crowley leveraged their existing relationships to get ground logistics through Liberia and Senegal. Omni returned our service members, you can see there, when we had a hard time getting people to, one, take the flights, two, let us land in places, and they used their leverage to help that. And others were opting to keep their distance from this operation, and they came to, to us. So I want to stop for a second, and not just our commercial partners, but if you're in this room, you turn the lights up for a second, and you participated in this operation in any way, if you were a planner, a CRW person, an air crew, maintenance, commercial, please stand. Please. <laughs> this could have been devastating for the world. You see this time person of the year? Well, you are this face. You are the person of the year. I want to thank you for selflessly serving others. Hundreds of thousands of people you will never meet are alive today because of you. Wow. Don't go searching for your legacy. You live it every single day. I'm old enough that I can say I'm proud of this team and mean it. And your great country is proud of you as well although they have no idea what you did. They just know you did it, and they are safe. Now, speaking of doing a lot, here's a slide that I wasn't going to show, because at nauseum, we've been talking about this. You've heard every speaker talking about the magnitude of your operations. Uh, there's a couple reasons I put it up there. I wanted you to know that I know, that you know that I know, that I know. 
because you lived it, you know what these numbers are like. The other reason I did it is I've got people, and they spent a lot of time working on this slide. <laughs> it's a good-looking slide. And I, I couldn't help but show it. The numbers are big. And, and this really is the present. And keeping up with this year's theme, Mobility Airmen, Excellence in Action, Past, Present, and Future, let's talk about a little bit about what I see the future looking like. Anybody have any idea what this is? It's not an eight-track cassette. <laughs> it's a VHS tape rewinder. Yeah, there was a special machine made just to re rewind the tapes. You know who owned these? A company called Blockbuster. Anybody heard of them? Th there was actually a time in our American culture where you couldn't imagine a Friday evening where you wouldn't stop by Blockbuster, pick up some VHF tapes on your way home. If it was a three to four day weekend, you'd leave there with a stack. This was binge watching before you got Netflix, right? You would have a stack of these tapes. You religiously went to this company and they had suckered you in, even though they never had what you wanted. They had really low inventory. Somebody had already checked out the really good stuff. And then they charged you exorbitant late fees and charged you extra to use that machine that they had that, to rewind. I couldn't even believe that. In 1994, they were valued at $8.4 billion. That's pretty doggone amazing. They were a fixture in every corner of this country. In the past decade, this has been the picture in towns across America. That was the be kind, please rewind thing if you, that they had on every tape to remind you that they were going to charge you money if you didn't do it. They had made actually over $500 million in profit on late fees and rewind fees. And you know what killed them? Arrogance. In 2000, Netflix could have actually, I mean, Blockbuster could have purchased Netflix for $50 million. As a matter of fact, the Netflix founder, Red, Reed Hastings, made a presentation to the Blockbuster board that said, let us handle your online stuff for you. And they dismissed him. Why in the world would a company that was so successful not take advantage of something that was coming new? They thought that this whole concept of mailing DVDs to you at your home, allowing you to select them on the internet and have them arrive at home was not gonna last, it was a phase. And they poo-pooed that CEO. They were living large. The other thing that kept them from changing was the fact that their board was the same folks who lived through the, the good years. So all the people that were around during the success couldn't imagine there not being success. They were the best. They were part of the fabric of the country. Why would they need to change? Please be kind, rewind. Disgruntled customers. Reed Hastings went out and tried this thing called streaming. And the rest is history. Reed Hastings' company, Netflix, had to get past mailing DVDs and get into streaming. And they were willing to go there. Blockbuster couldn't get past Redbox and Netflix themselves. They missed a trend. They thought it was just a fad and they continue to charge that extra dollar for rewinding and torquing me off. <laughs> we are an outstanding organization. Some might say great, not good, but will we always be? Is there a new trend or capability out there that we aren't paying attention to that threatens to turn us into blockbuster? I'm gonna coin a, a verb. Will we be blockbustered at some point? The difference is, Blockbuster was dealing with shareholder value. 
We're dealing with the freedom of the world. We can't afford to fail. There are three big things that I think we've got to keep an eye on, cyber readiness and recapitalization. And let me go to cyber very quickly. You can't imagine an, a, a, a world that's not connected everywhere. It's a leap in productivity and efficiency, but it makes us doggone vulnerable. Next slide. This is a thing that's about to come up called the Norse map. This is running live right now on the internet, and what it shows you is every single attack that's happening on a network around the world in real time. The Joint Cyber Center, my team tells me that we have 380 attacks a day at Transcom. Look at the hot spot in the center of the United States. Those are the cornfields of Illinois and Scott Air Force Base. That should make you nervous. We have made strides. But a lot of our capability is not inside our enclave and our network. It lies with our commercial partners and those folks outside the Doden that we need to work with. Next slide. This is a, a readiness slide that concerns me a lot. If you look back to the early parts of the 2000s, 2010, look at those numbers and look where we are today in billions of dollars. So with that decline in revenue, how will we keep everybody ready? Go one block to the right of that. Look at how long we're, we're going to keep the C-17 around, 40 years, at about 1,000 hours per jet per year. But look just below that. That's what we're actually flying. And that's the result if we keep that pace. Those numbers roughly equate to 2033 and 2024. That's a big difference. And let me give you a secret. There's no replacement between now and those times. We've got to do something different. Look at the numbers of the US flagged vessels. You're, I know you're going, OK, we're airmen. We don't care about boats. I said that too two months ago. <laughs> I care now. And they're called ships. I also care about mariners more than I ever thought I would. The reason I care so much is look at how much those US flagged vessels have come down and look at what 60 ships will do you in C-17s. That's 18,000 C-17s, by the way. So why do I care about ships? Why should you care about ships? If we're going to extend the life of the C-17, which we'll need to, you need me to make sure that we've got ships. And our country needs this discussion to happen. People say that there's lots of ships out there that can move our goods and services. But who owns them? When we go to war the next time, you want US flagged ships? Or do you want Russian flagged ships, Chinese flagged ships? I would say that we want to have a core set of US flagged ships that we can rely on in this country that we know can get our goods to the fight. That's why we all should care. And that's very, very important to all of us in this enterprise. And 18,000 is a lot of C-17s. Next slide. I had about 35 minutes worth of talk on, on tankers. And I was going to start with what's in common with these two airplanes. <laughs> but General Welsh did an excellent job of walking you down the legacy and history of this magnificent airframe. So I'm going to cut my 35 minutes of tanker talk down to about 35 seconds, not to belittle the contribution, but because I think he did it better than I could do justice. But why do we put it there? Because I'm just as concerned that we need the next variant on the table right now. I'm, I'm happy what I'm hearing lately, but we got to keep the pressure on. Next slide. So this is an important picture. It does a couple things for, for me. Uh, it reminds me that I was, in fact, young once. Uh, the second was, that guy thought he was the best tanker pilot in the world. He was. <laughs> he was a schoolhouse instructor. He's actually teaching, counting. I mean, he's doing all of those wonderful things. But that guy used to joke 
back in about 1989 that he would never be able to take his grandchildren to see a tanker in a museum because we'd still be flying them when his grandchildren were born. My grandson was born eight months ago. A, two, a couple chiefs ago, um, the quote was from General Mosley that the mother of the last KC-135 pilot hasn't been born yet. Well, I'm committed to ensuring that she has been born now. We can't have any more delays in the program. We can't. Let's keep on the pressure. Next slide. Simply, you're our legacy. You do amazing things. But I want to challenge you. I challenged you last year, and I'm going to repeat the challenge. One of my favorite books, of a hundred of my favorite books, is a book built to last by the authors that did good to great. We are great. The book built to last chronicles companies that have been around for at least a hundred years to get in the book. One of my favorite stories in there is about American Express. They started out as a Pony Express company. They weren't arrogant. They were willing to change when they realized that being a Pony Express company wasn't going to be their enduring future. Look at them today. There are countless other examples. Blockbuster won't ever make that book. We need to. The book talks that you should be willing to change when you're at the top of your game and not when you're in crisis. We're at the top of our game. My, my team gave me that quote. It's a really sophisticated quote from a good piece of literature. I, I go to a little bit better source for my quotes. Next slide. The Lorax. The great philosopher, the Lorax, I think says it best. You need to care about your Air Force. You need to start adding that pronoun, my, our, to your lexicon. It's not the Air Force. It's my Air Force your Air Force. You know how best it needs to be for the future. You and I own it. We're no longer in a place where we can afford to just grouse about it and wait for somebody else to do it. It's our responsibility to hand it off in better shape than we found it. And you're the best, most talented, battle-tested Air Force we've ever had. I'm going to close now with my last video. Uh, this was at my assumption of command just a mere two months ago, and I thought I'd give you a, a, a real good quote from, from our boss. Next slide. None of us know when the United States will have to respond quickly to even greater crises in the coming months, or where your capabilities will be needed to save lives, defend our country, and make a better world. We know the people of Transcom will carry forward a steadfast commitment to deliver what our force requires whenever, wherever they require it. We know that it is because of these capabilities and your contributions, your contributions, that we remain the finest military force the world has ever known. Thank you. Right after he said that, I got a chance to, to give my remarks, and I said this. I make a commitment to all of you that when our country calls, this command will be ready to respond rapidly, anywhere, anytime. And I ended it with, Mr. Secretary, I promise. I had no doubts I could make that promise because my promise is backed up by you. Every day, in thousands of ways, in every corner of this world without fanfare and without fail. Thank you very much.